Amira, thank you so much for joining us on the show. I've been following you on Instagram and have been such a fan of your paintings and your work and just you as a person, as you share more of who you are through your social platforms. And so I'm really stoked to get to talk to you today. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. All right. So you are a full-time artist and I'm dying to know what a day in the life looks like for you. Like, what is your day like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it ups and flows, um, you know, really depends on urgent deadlines and sort of um, if I have any big projects, but it doesn't include painting all the time, which is probably a surprise to some people. It certainly was a surprise to myself as I kind of got more busy and, um, you know, more like, I guess, known, the more your brand becomes more visible and you attract more customers, it seems like the less painting you're doing. So <laughs> um, it's sort of just like the nature of the, the business. But um, I would say like on a, a good day for me, I wake up and um, make myself some breakfast. I'll head into the studio. I love listening to podcasts or like audiobooks while I'm in um, my painting flow and I'll paint for a few hours and then I usually switch gears and um, do a lot of admin tasks or try to think of other um, creative ventures that I'm working on and um, a lot of customer service and hopefully kind of finding some time for myself at the end of the day just to kind of like mellow out. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much like a typical day for me if there is such a thing exists. You know, I always think of having deadlines for myself, like working with a client and just being under all this pressure. I never think of a painter and this part of this podcast is just to debunk some myths, right? And to really right. inside look at what it's like. And so I did not imagine you saying like, you know, if I'm rushing toward a deadline, like I would just always imagine it being puppies and rainbows, but definitely idyllic, right? Like super artsy, like you're in your overalls covered in paint, like the Instagram version of what a painter looks like, right? Yeah. And so I'm curious to hear like what kinds of projects and deadlines you do have. Like when is it that you're working on a deadline? What are you trying to accomplish? What are the deliverables and to whom? Yeah, yeah. Th those are really great questions because like it, it changes so much. And I think that's what keeps my day pretty exciting. I was one of those people where I, I kind of find myself, I used to find myself like kind of looking flaky and not really knowing what job was right for me and kind of being okay at different things. But um, it, wasn't, I, it wasn't until I started working for myself where I feel like I really tapped into my zone of genius. And I think it be, it's because it is so challenging. I'm one of those people where if I already know what the end result is going to be like, and I'm like, oh, I just do X, Y, and Z, and then that's the result, I kind of get bored really easily. So um, it's nice to not know um, what the end looks like for me. But, um, you know, a lot of days it is super dreamy, and it is like rolling out of bed and painting and like, you know, taking a break from my creative um, burdens with like Netflix and watching TV <laughs> having a two hour bath, you know, and it's, it's so many days like that, um, that I really indulged in, I think, especially last year. Um, whereas like now I'm, I'm definitely more, I would say almost wearing two different hats. And I was sort of thinking about that. I definitely feel like more of a boss this year. And it's challenging because there are a lot of days where I can't do what I want to do. I kind of have to do the things to keep my business going and um, to move forward. So um, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. I don't remember. <laughs> well, like part of my question though is what are your deadlines for? Like are you working right. on mission paintings okay. or are you working on a collaboration with a client who commissioned yeah. you for something yeah, or so is it, you know, prints for your Etsy or, you know, what, like how, how do people pay you money for your paintings? Okay. Yeah. So like a couple things came up this past in the past 30 days, right? So just to give a glimpse of what it looked like, um, I host an artist community called Passion Color Joy. And um, I, 
I've been kind of focusing on a lot of other things and September is something about September where you're always just sort of like you just want to get back in gear whatever that means for you and so I decided to invite the community to do a 30 paintings in 30 days challenge knowing full and well that I probably wasn't going to be able to do all 30 days of the paintings um and then like in the midst of that my licensing company and uh, they contacted me and they said that hey um do you have any more of these camels because we well first they asked me if it was okay to produce them if it was good for production and i sort of told them that you know like i had already um sold them on my own i ran some editions on my own so we couldn't use them exclusively for that company um and so i had to reproduce like recreate some new uh, work for them and that came out of nowhere and they're like yeah we really want these on the shelves in time for the holidays obviously you know because it's a it's a big um the biggest like commercial season for us and so that came out of nowhere and i was like crap okay now i gotta paint these camels like sort of shift gears and then um commissions as well so also juggling commissions um this pat the past few weeks has been pretty interesting so i have a commission from a client in Australia that I, they, he's been pretty slow paced. I think he's like a PhD student. So he's really laid back. He's just sort of like, hey, can you do this again? And I just want you to make this painting for me. Um, and then I had a couple who reached out. It's actually a husband and it's really cool. Cause like um, he found my work and I guess his wife was looking at my work. And he said that, you know, he noticed his wife like looking at my artwork and um, they were trying to conceive for a couple of years and sort of struggling with that. And um, they were able to have success. They just had their first child. And he was like, he, he wants to um, have me create this painting for her as a push gift. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, and um, the painting itself was, uh, the title of it was called New Beginnings. And so he wanted me to kind of like recreate that, but with the colors that she loves, she really loves like orange and things like that. So. I've been really um, focusing on trying to get that painting exactly where they want it, which is challenging because um, you can't really, like, at least for me, I don't, I don't really, like, I don't know, carbon copy my work. So, and it's really intuitive and, like, free-flowing. It's abstract, right? So it's, like, um, you know, it's, it's random. And us, essentially, it's really random. Um, and yeah, I want to give our listeners some insight because obviously this is a podcast and <laughs> everyone should go to your Instagram. We'll link to it in um, our show notes, but your work is incredibly colorful and abstract. And I think it's really interesting, this camel that you've done, because I see it on your Instagram from time to time. And it seems to be like one of those most popular pieces or like one of those pieces that a lot of probably your more mainstream audience gravitates toward. Um, so I actually kind of want to ask you about that. Like, how does licensing work? And, you know, did, did someone see that and they were like, we want to sell it? And then do you feel ever, it's almost like being typecasted if you're an actor, for example, and you don't want to be typecast into the same role. Are you ever like, oh my gosh, that fucking camel, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, no, that totally happened because, um, I was living in Dubai, well, Abu Dhabi to be exact, for a few years, and uh, I started painting these camels, and I only did a few. Um, I did, like, one, and then I would do another one, and then, like, I, did, I had maybe, like, three or four, um, but they were so fun for me to create, and uh, someone had commented on Instagram, like, oh, you're starting to be known as the camel lady, and I was pissed. I was like, I don't know, like, I'm not a camel artist, you know, or even like an animal artist, because you really could get pigeonholed into that. And um, uh, my brother, he's sort of creative too. And he's in, he's in like to tech and all that. He was like, yeah, you really need to try a new animal. You know, he was sort of like, um, and it, this kind of raises the other question, right, in terms of branding, sort of, um, do you keep doing the one thing until you're, you're like, almost saturated in a market where you are pigeonhole right and um or do you prove how versatile you are and that you can do everything and it's something that i really grappled with in the beginning um because the for me i i think I, and this still is, i don't know i could just talk on and on about that but just like i always kind of felt that i needed to prove that i could paint so many different subjects and that i was skilled in so many different areas and i kept um jumping from one thing to the next 
And then uh, it, it became apparent, I guess, like after a year or two of selling my work online that you almost do need to pigeonhole yourself. And it's not permanent, you know, but um, it's sort of like, this is what you're known for right now. And the only way, like a lot of people, they're sort of like, how do I get popular online? Or like, how do I brand myself for it? Um, I, at least in the artist community, like the visual artist community, it's so hard for people to feel like they stick out and feel like they offer something unique. And I think um, what usually works is just doing the same thing like over and over and over again. It's really hard to train yourself that way because if you're creative, then there's a good chance you're all over the place and you could do so many different things. So um, yeah, the, the camels actually, um, to answer your question, I had put a few up on uh, this website um, and I was actually in the UAE and I was, I was driving and I remember getting a call from the licensing company and it was like the creative director and he was like, hey, um, we saw your work online. We wanted to set up a meeting and I was like, holy shit, I was like, I was like freaked out, you know, because um, I remember going there as a tourist and um, this is like 2014 and like finding myself in one of their, their shops and just like being in love with the way they were um, presenting art to the market. It was so modern. Um, beautiful, colorful, uh, abstract, and just very well done. And I just remember looking and just saying like, man, like how can I get my work in there, you know? And I didn't think much of it. And then a few years later, it, it happened. And I was just sort of like, this is surreal. Um, and yeah, we had a meeting. They, I kind of showed them a, a variety of the work that I did, but they were really interested in the camels. And um, you know, it's pretty commercial too. They kind of, they understand that they, they communicate something to the market. And so that was really cool just to see like an idea um, touch so many people. You know, I think travelers and expats living in another country could be really lonely and really isolating. And so there's something about those camel faces that really resonated with people. And it was just like fun and sort of cheeky. And, I mean, they also yeah. have like, they're kind of done in your abstract style, like with that expression that you bring to the canvas with all of your work. That's super consistent. I mean, let's talk about branding. I feel like the fact that you can do different subjects and explore new things there is still that quality whenever when, where whenever i see a painting i know it's yours and i follow a lot of abstract painters <laughs> and i always know that it's your work whenever i see it um and you brought that to the camels but what's really cool about them also is just the there is this like whimsy expression that they have and there's so much life to these camels so okay well, hold on i have okay, okay. something to say because i think the thing that Let's you're explaining it here is like is the plight of you know creative selling their work and this idea that yeah. you, can either, you can either sell what the market wants or you can create what the market wants and sell and sell your creativity um or you can do whatever you want and potentially not sell it and i i do think there is this there has to be this uh release of attachment one way or right. the other and sort of finding that sweet spot and i love that you found it um or i love that you are down for exploring whatever is going to take you, whichever way it needs to be. And it doesn't have to be all one way or all the other. I like that you found this place where you can, you can have your camels, but you can also do your, you know, abstract commissions, um, abstract commissions as well, and, or just create freely, but still, but still sort of serve the market in whatever way they're literally asking you to serve them. Yeah, it is challenging. I, um, this morning I sold a painting and it was a piece I created in Sedona a couple of weeks ago. And um, it was probably one of the most revealing piece of works I ever done. Maybe at first glance, no one would really look at it. And, but it was, it was literally like me <laughs> painting an experience I had, you know? <laughs> and so, um, it's pretty abstract, but she bought it and I, I actually like canceled the order and I, I just sent her a note and I told her like, I'm sorry, this isn't for sale. I should have taken it off my website, but um, the painting sold for a couple hundred dollars and I just felt like, well, A, I'm in a position now where I could sort of say like there's certain work I don't want to sell and that, that to me is, is really good that mm -hmm. I don't, um, you know, like need the sales or I mean, I don't know, like 
it's not that I don't need the art sales, but I'm trying to design a business for myself where no one uh, stream of income is sort of the only stream of income. And so um, it, sh it, it requires a lot of multitasking and like managing and all that, but it is good to have that freedom. Um, so yeah, I'm like, uh, I don't want to sell that painting. You know, it's weird. It's like, but what a good place to find yourself for sure. And I also wonder if this plays into the idea of the starving artist, like the artist yeah. who's not willing to, you know, work for the market or whatever, um, versus those that just sell out and only create for the market. So I think there, I think there's a, a fun middle place where you can be creative and be fulfilled by it. Mm -hmm. Um, but also sell enough of what you do that you're able to say no when things come along that you don't want to sell. Yeah, and I just want to say too that it's, I also thought sort of like when I was starting out, I was like, what, what's selling? What does the market want? Blah, blah, blah. And you can try to fit into that mold or you can create your own market. And I feel that, I feel like everyone can create their own market. Whatever you're selling, there's someone out there that, that's interested in it. Um, and a lot of times they're not even interested in the work, they're interested in you. So you're either going to put yourself as a spotlight, depending on how comfortable you are. Um, me, I like to hide behind my work. I don't want to be a personality. I don't ever intend on being a personality. But there are a lot of people that are very comfortable being personalities. And their work may not be um, as great as other people on Instagram or on other websites, but um, they're visible and they're loud. Like, they're the loudest people in the room, so people gravitate towards that. Um, but you know, I think really a lot of it is just creating your own market as visual artists. We have to do that. And, um, you know, it's, it is kind of sad to, to see a lot of the people, um, cause that now I'm in this position where I'm sort of like, um, providing solutions for other artists and, um, creating an environment for other artists to achieve maybe some of the things I have in the past few years. And so I'm almost like inundated with a lot of beginner artists and a lot of beginner artists mindset and um it is kind of like difficult for me at times to like I don't know coach or help because I feel like a lot of times people are sort of trying to play into the market whatever that is instead of creating that market for themselves and I feel like that's where the that's where the magic happens like that's really where the fun is yeah. And you see it in their work too, right? Whenever they're trying mm -hmm. to just play to a market, their work isn't as authentic or true. And I think that this not only applies to visual art, but it applies to anyone who's creating anything. Whenever we're just trying to follow someone else's formula, it never rings as true as if you were to really find your voice, really hone your craft. I mean, yeah. I'm curious how many beginning artists are you like, stop freaking out about business and maybe become a better painter? Right. Oh no, I can't say happy. that. <laughs> I can't say that. Like, I've, I've never said that. But do you I ever wanna... think it? Like, do you ever think it? Like, maybe worry yeah, more about your skills before you worry about the business side of things. Because I want to preach that from the rooftops across all disciplines. Yeah, I can't really say that. I just feel like it's weird. I, I've had I've had situations where, um, so for me, I have started teaching this past year, and I did not teach art that was a very conscious choice because I was like this is my like like the love of my life like I'm not going to teach you how to do that like I was very like precious about it you know um I'm so I'm starting to shift um in the, the past month I've done some things and um I taught an in-person workshop uh in August that I prepped for like emotionally for an entire year but before I was just sort of teaching uh, social media or like general business things and it was interesting because um yeah you do you do sort of create that inspiration and um it's a good thing but yeah uh Kathleen you definitely have to work on the craft and like love that part first so 
I guess people find out on their own. <laughs> I don't know if it's really <laughs> my job to like tell people. I mean, that. and you know, I would never want to be snarky or in a position where I'm telling someone that they're not good enough because I don't think that's true either. Like, I think that what you were saying about creating a market, that there is a market for everyone at every skill level to connect with their dream client in that moment. And yeah. that your dream yeah. client will evolve as you evolve and grow. So it's not just that, it's just more of this idea of focus on the craft first, in, in my opinion, like focus mm -hmm. on getting the thing where you really want it and finding your voice and then focus on branding and marketing and growing your following from there so that you're growing yeah. it on this true foundation that really authentically reflects who you actually are. Yeah, it's sort of hard because I, I see the merit in doing both, but what typically happens I, I do see a lot of artists trying to um, create uh, the spaces for them to get paid and sort of like setting up their business and um, having a brand and like having a logo and like hiring people and almost like jumping into that part and uh, literally saying that like, I don't have my style, I'm still learning how to paint or I just took this workshop a couple days ago um, but they have their shop like ready. It's like ready to go. Now they just have to fill it with work. Um, whereas like you, like in my mind, it was always the opposite, but, um, I just feel like I, I did have a point with that. I forgot. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> well, what I love that you're saying is that it's both at the same time and it's not fit, make your artwork perfect before you, you know, sell it because I think that that's a problem that we see creatives across a lot of industries really struggle with where they're really trying to, sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, do you have a way to articulate the point of starting your selling your art before you're ready, but then also continuing to hone your craft. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's just yeah. more cyclical. Right. And I, I think you're both saying it perfectly, fantastically, where it is both. But if you find yourself in a position where you have branded yourself and you have a business and your customers are confused and you're not finding passion or fulfillment in the craft that you're doing, it's because you need to go back and perfect the thing that you're trying to sell before you try to sell it. Because I think that translates both in your work and not having the expertise that you um that you want or not like having the time to focus on what it is that you're trying to cultivate. Um, and it is reflected to the people you're trying to sell it to where they're confused as to what it is that you're here doing as well. So both, if you find yourself in the position where your business is ready, but your art is not focus on your art. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, but also we don't want to perpetuate any sort of starving artist situation. Right. So. If you're great at art, but need to focus on your business, do that too. Yeah. Well, I can just say, like, I, I did remember what I was going to say um, earlier. It was just that sometimes if, if when you have the artists that are sort of like, or in any business where they have the shop in place and they don't really have the, um, like the goods, they're frustrated and they're sort of like, I'm not getting any sales, right? Like they have like the brand, the site, everything, but the work itself isn't there. And they kind of know it's there. They, they know where their own work is at but um they're sort of like you know i'm not getting into sales and it, it gets really frustrating and i think it could be frustrating when you're coming when you're starting at that point of like this is my business this is my so it's tricky because i do admire the fact that they're kind of thinking ahead and like you know like planning for the fact that it will be a business um but i'm always like like, yo, like, go have fun, like, explore. I feel like you can sell your story before you can sell your work. So sell the process, sell the journey, and um, people gravitate towards that. Like, no, I honestly think no one wants to hear from me anymore. It's like, it's done. At least on my personal Facebook, I, I have, like, a lot of Facebook friends that I've never met, but they sort of saw, they saw my progression from, sure, I might work online for an entire year, um, moving, uh, posting and doing like doing things like that before I had a blog and then I got a website. So they saw it all and they were like, yay. But they, I feel like in their heads, they're like, okay, like she's good now. Like she made it, she's fine. They don't want to hear from me and I try not to inundate them too much. Or maybe it's just my own sort of like, you know, like 
Facebook is weird in general. Facebook is always weird. It's always like, am I sharing? You have like, to find your platform for sure. Yeah, and I think for visual, right for visual artists, like Instagram can definitely be that place. And and you know what I hear you mm-hmm. what I hear you saying here is, you know, sharing along the way and. And I, I do think that that story piece is hugely important for artists and being able to sell what it is that they do and position themselves. I mean, it's hard to say like position yourself as experts in your field, like you can for coaches or, you know, um, developers or those sorts of things. Cause I think it is a little bit different. Um, but you can position yourself as the expert of your point of view, which is what you are selling through your work. And you do that by sharing um, yeah. the process along the way which is just as important as like marketing the actual final product as well. Right. Sometimes like in our case, it's almost more important. Um, it's that experience and, um, you know, you can share that immediately. But yeah, I agree, Emily. Just like Instagram is the perfect platform, I think. I never feel like I'm bothering people when I post on Instagram. <laughs> so, right. They're yeah. definitely choosing to be there to see beautiful things. And let's talk yeah. about your Instagram for a second because you do have a bumping one and it is beautiful. <laughs> um, do you have any tips for artists who are wanting to to make their Instagram game a little more fantastic? Yeah. Um, well, one tip I really like is just sort of like getting away from the idea that your Instagram is your blog. And um, I used to think that I had to post in real time. And uh, it wasn't until I started shifting how I view the platform. And and I don't want to say curate because a lot of my images are really just on the fly. They're not super edited or professional, but shifting that mentality of, I can only share what I'm actually doing right now on Instagram. I like to um, take a lot of photos, save a lot of photos, and then repost them and come back to them. So it's not, uh, you're not trying to come up with content, you know? And I feel like as artists, we have a huge advantage on Instagram because um, I think that's it's why I've, I'm teaching Instagram now. And I, I love working with artists specifically because I just feel like we have that competitive advantage because it's such a visual platform. I mean, if you look at bloggers or graphic designers, um, and they, if, when they decide, okay, what am I going to post on Instagram? They may have to put together a graphic or figure out something or share something completely off brand. Um, but for artists, we have so much to share. Um, whether it's your picture of your supplies, your workspace, your studio, um, a process shot, these time lapse videos that has been huge in my own um, growth on Instagram, really strategically. Uh, a year ago, I had came back from Italy and I, w- I actually took a social media workshop and I came back and I was just sort of like really relaxed. I was like, oh, I just hit 10,000 followers and I didn't really want any more followers. I was like, this is great, you know, sort of like the idea of like, what's enough money for you? I was like, $10,000, that's enough, you know, like, I can get back to work now. Um, And then Instagram widened their video capacity from like 15 seconds to one minute. And I had posted a few videos. And I remember like the second video I posted, it got over 100,000 views and 3000 followers in 24 hours. And I was like, Oh, my God, like, this is crazy. So I, and I did that in my pajamas, you know, it was like, I was just on the floor, <laughs> I was just on the floor. And so I'm like, I don't have to show my face. I don't have to show my hunky boy or bae or whatever. I don't have to show my fancy house. I only have to show my artwork. And I feel like, um, that's so good for us as artists, you know, it's like, and just as human beings, because it's not always shiny and dreamy and perfect, you know, so I know you guys, your motto is do the work, right? And so with Instagram, it's just like, show the work, just show the work, show the work, show the work. And the followers will come, the love will come and then the sales will come. (laughs) Yeah. I also have to call some attention here to all of our product makers, like not even artists, but product makers. So often we get question from, um, from those creatives. And they're like, I don't know what kind of content to share or what am I putting on social media and all of those things. And you just laid it out very clearly what it is that you can be putting. It's not all about the finished product, though. That's definitely what people are buying. Whenever someone's buying a pair of earrings or a cool 
shirt that you've designed or any of those things, mm -hmm. what is going to super inspire them and help make them uh, make that decision to buy your thing was the process and the story behind it just as much, even if not more so than the finished product. So shout out to all of our product makers out there. Rewind and re-listen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, I'm constantly thinking about how can I create an experience for my audience online? And that's really difficult. Um, I think it's something that's always evolving because most, we live in a world where most people are making purchases on the internet. And so they're not able to go in and touch your art and see things and talk to you. And so I'm, I'm thinking about that now. I mean, I like my website, but I'm still sort of like, okay, what do I need to shift um, in the next few months to sort of make people feel like they're in the room with my artwork? And um, the same with Instagram. And so what I tell a lot of the, the students that go through my courses is just, you want to create um, a context for your work. And I feel like Instagram is a great platform. If you just post an image of your painting and there's no context around how does that painting look in a room? How does it fit in a space? The size of it, um, the light, the texture. Is, if you could convey one painting in so many different ways, and I feel like that's why we should never really have a shortage of ideas. And you should have an overflow of images to share on Instagram, um, not, not the opposite. I love it. Agreed. You know, and one thing that I noticed that I think that you do so well is one, that consistency of style. So you do have this aesthetic that you are known for and you're posting it over and over and over and over again. And I think that this is where really being prolific and not being afraid to hit publish on a work in progress is so important. But I also wonder how, you know, 30 day challenges play into this. So you are um, producing or hosting a challenge right now, like paint 30 paintings in 30 days. Is this a way for artists to really get into the habit of, you know, producing not only the work, but also sharing the work as they go? Yeah, exactly. And um, the challenge ran from the beginning of September until the end of September. So we're still kind of like coming out of it. But um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's you really have to practice like detachment. And for me, I feel like one of the best ways to be prolific is to work on more than one painting at a time. And um, not sort of like getting hung up on this idea of you have this spark of inspiration and then you're gonna see it through and then the painting is finished and it's like, oh my God, this is amazing or it's terrible. But it's more so about, I, I look at the, the artwork as, is almost having conversations with each other and then you develop a body of work really naturally because you could um, sort of be in that same energy when you're creating it. And um, it's crazy, like it's like a madhouse, you know, you're just grabbing stuff, you're reaching for whatever. And um, I think the 30 paintings in 30 days challenge, it's, it's difficult because you have to put the work up and publish it just like you said. So it is nice to kind of give yourself constraints and sort of say, all right, I'm only going to create um, with these limitations or under this color palette or this size. Uh, a lot of times I like to try something I wouldn't normally do, like faces, for instance, or um, landscapes or whatever. Um, now I've been really into painting flowers and it's kind of fun because I've always told myself I suck at painting flowers. Like I can't paint flowers. And um, I just sort of like stopped telling myself that story. It's like, why am I telling myself I can't paint flowers? You know, like my flowers aren't gonna look like other people's flowers, but you know, I can paint flowers if I feel like it. So I'm, now I'm like trying to paint flowers and it looks kind of awkward and they're a little lopsided and weird. And you know, and it's like, all right, well, this is, <laughs> this is where I'm at. But yeah, the challenges are great. Um, you know, challenges are good just for getting out of the funk, I think, in, in any space. Right. And we're always talking about building boundaries with when, within which you can be creative because it's in those places where you can, you can really do unusual things. I mean, whenever you have the whole, whole world in front of you, we hear so many creatives talking about overwhelm. Mm -hmm. Talk about overwhelm when you can do anything in any way that you want. But if you need to build yourself those constraints in order to be super creative, um, I think do it because so much cool stuff can come from it, including you just doing the thing. Yeah. And what's nice, well, like a lot of the people that went through the challenge, they 
they've been commenting and saying like, oh, now I have all this work, you know, now I have all this work coming up for the holidays to sell or I have a show for a gallery or maybe you want to get into a gallery. So that's nice. It's like you kind of have that constraint of the 30 days where you know you have to create and use 30 days. And then if you want to just kind of be on the couch for the rest of the year, you can just say, well, at least I did those 30 day paintings, you know? So um, yeah, it's, I don't know. Artists are weird. I feel like we're, <laughs> I, I'm very much like in that business mode all the time. And so it's, it's so funny now kind of like interacting with so many artists and just realizing like we're very unusual. I think when we start to work with the time, it's just very like, just like a finicky bunch, you know, and it's just like, right. I don't know, like, it's just weird. <laughs> Kathleen and I have been working with creatives and talking with creatives and being creatives for long enough that we totally hear you. Yes. For yeah. sure. And talk about a group of people who have like this propensity to stand in their own way and to block themselves oh from God. success in whatever way it may be. And I love that. And I feel like especially visual artists like yourself tend to be at the top of that pile. Yeah, like they gosh. really tend to be pretty good at standing in their own way. So I love that you're speaking about this. Um, as someone with both points of view so that you can do it as the visual artist who's getting up and painting all day and, you know, taking breaks to watch Netflix or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Um, but you also have the business brain that helps you build those boundaries, um, to do the work, to like do the customer service, like all the things that actually helps you get paid to be the artist that you are, because both of those things are super important in this realm of being. And that's where I really want to, you know, wrap up this conversation is talking about getting paid. And so Amira, I would love to hear your top three pieces of advice that maybe an aspiring painter or really any creative entrepreneur, I feel like all the advice we've been talking about here today applies across the board. But um, specifically, I would love to hear maybe three pieces of advice that you would give to an emerging artist who wants to fully support themselves with their creativity, or maybe even sharing some experiences and turning points for you that really made the difference for you whenever it came to actually selling your work? Um, Yeah, well, I would say that the first part really helped me was finding something that I felt like I could be a student of and never get bored with. Um, Whatever that is, it could be a certain medium, it could be a political idea or a cause that you're really passionate about that you need to express in your work. Um, I am really interested in sort of the the effects that color has on our emotions and our mood. And um, I realized that I have a unique color sense, mostly from other people sort of telling me that like, oh, you use color in a really interesting way. And so I sort of stripped out everything else and said, well, let me just focus on color. And so color is the muse right now and it's still the muse. So I would say the first thing is find something that you're willing to study and sort of like be a lifelong student of. And that becomes your niche. It's like, that's what you're not gonna get bored with doing. Um, And then the second thing would be to um, create a very professional, like start, start to look at, what you're doing in a professional manner and um, treat it as such. And so that requires a little bit of discipline. I I remember for a long time, I was only painting like a few paintings a year and it was always a hobby. And then I started to treat it like, you know, like a yoga practice, how people kind of do yoga every day, or you really have to buckle down and sort of get that um, in your, under your belt first. And then the last thing, would be to just ask for the sale. I think, um, I don't know if that's something that you guys talk about with people recently, but you know, asking for money is so hard. And I was sharing work online for an entire year and I, I was like wondering why no one was just asking to buy it, you know? And it wasn't until I posted a painting and asked, does anyone want to buy this? And then I got four inquiries that I realized like, oh, okay, this is what entrepreneurship feels like, you know, like, this is it, you know, Um, and it's so scary. But um, the more comfortable you can get with selling things, um, the easier it will be. 
I feel like this is the number one piece of advice I've been giving to everyone lately who's wanting to make more money doing what they love is ask for the money, right? <laughs> so really just remind them to hire you is really what it comes down to. And don't take it for granted that people um, don't need to be prompted. Like people need to be prompted and they're just waiting to give you their money for the value that you're going to provide for them or for the artwork that you're going to provide for them. Um, they just need to be told what to do. Yeah. So much. It's just, it's one of those things that's so hard and there is like a lot of money mindset blocks that go into jumping that hurdle, but it's also so incredibly simple. It's one of the easiest things that you can do. It's just remind them every single time. Yeah, it's, it's really scary, especially, be, I guess, like, I don't know, selling services, you kind of feel like, oh, this is a solution, but, like, selling artwork, it is a luxury item. You're not really, I don't know, we so undervalue our work as artists, you know? I'm, I'm like, literally about to say something, and I'm, I had to stop myself, because I'm like, you're not literally changing anyone's lives with your artwork, but you don't know that. I mean, there's a good chance that you are. <laughs> so, um yeah, I just feel like sometimes the selling part, I remember almost apologizing when I would ask for money, sort of like, oh, this painting is $75. I'm so sorry, you know, and it's almost like you feel bad that you need to get compensated for the work. So yeah, I, I have a whole bunch of stuff. I sold a painting for like 10 bucks, like a cheeseburger. <laughs> I always think back like that's like my Big Mac painting because I think it was like less than a Big Mac. But I was so happy that the lady wanted to buy it. I was like, oh my gosh, well, how much do you want to pay me for it? She, I did the conversion. It was like a couple bucks. And I was like, well, okay, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like after I let it, have parted with it. But yeah. Well, hopefully now your paintings are buying you hundreds of Big Macs. <laughs> if not thousands of Big Macs. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe don't spend it all on Big Macs. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Amir, where can our listeners find more of you and your work? They can find me at my website on www.amirrahim.com and on Instagram at amirrahimarts. Perfect. And finally, what makes you feel most boss? Ooh, getting money for my art. <laughs> getting paid for my work. That makes me feel like a boss. <laughs> Amen. I love that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for coming to hang out with us. It was awesome to talk to you as, as a working artist, making it do, blending creativity with business and getting paid Big Macs to do it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much to our team and sponsors who make Being Boss possible. Our sound engineer and web developer, Corey Winter. Our editorial director and content manager, Caitlin Brain. Our community manager and social media director, Sharon Lukey. And our Bean counter, David Austin, with support from Braid Creative and Indie Shopography. Do the work, be boss, and we'll see you next week.